In the beginning, the old people told me, when Kung Kung, the great spirit, was first allocating places for all the animals in the world in which to live, the first hippopotamus couple came to Kung Kung. And this Adam and Eve of the hippopotamus world said, Ngung Ngung, you know, of all the things in the world, we love water best. Water is the only element in which we can possibly live. Please allow us to live in the water. And Ngung Ngung said, look, hippopotamus, I simply can't do it. Look at your big mouth. Look at those sharp teeth of yours. If I let you live in the water, you'll eat up all the fish. And the hippo said, Ngung Ngung, if you will let us live in the water, we will make a pact with you. We'll promise you that we will never eat any fish and that every morning we'll come out on land and we'll scatter our dung with our tails so that you can see there are no fish bones in it. And to this day, the hippopotamuses all over Africa continue to do that very thing. I've always loved the bush and desert of Africa more than any other part of the world. And this love seemed to be best explained in the words of the great Elizabethan physician who wrote, we carry within us the wonders we seek without. All Africa and her prodigies are within us. Even so, I never realized how much more there was to this until after the last war, which for me lasted nine years. A strange instinct made me reject my first chance of going home. Instead, I was drawn against all reason to return to this part of Africa that lies along the Limpopo River on South Africa's border with Mozambique. And I arrived here one evening, and I camped just over there. And I left the two African servants who were helping me. I left them cooking the evening meal, and I walked out to this place here. And as I came here, just from that direction over there, an enormous, majestic old kudu bull with these wonderful spiral horns came out of the bush straight towards me, paused saw me and then threw his head back and brought his nose forward and sniffed the air between me and him. And I felt immediately, my God, I've come home. And I felt immediately as if uh, the wall had just dropped like a chain from me. After this meeting with the Kudu Bull, gradually everything hateful, destructive and negative receded from me. I watched the animals in their beauty, in their delicacy, and in their respect for one another, moving through the bush, and something of the same kind was restored to me. Far from being brutalized by nature, far from finding nature red in tooth and claw, I realized it was us who projected our own inhumanity upon it. <laughs> Watching this immensely rich pageant of animal life, I was driven to reappraise the story of man's relationship with nature in the context of Africa, which has always been the world's greatest keep of natural life. 
From the beginning, the variety and the abundance was so great that wherever the first man went, he was never alone, but always with some animal eye upon him, known as he knew them. And in the process, a feeling of kinship and belonging developed. He, like them, never killed except for food. And it was to the animals in their astonishing variety that man turned as to a mirror in which to discover hidden aspects of himself. From the diversity of animals and animal behavior, he recognized the diversity of his own nature, became more aware of himself and of life, and gradually attained a greater degree of consciousness. The first evidence of this process is that man painted animals long before he painted himself. Everywhere on the rocks he painted this vision of his participation in nature with such delicacy precision and beauty, that the whole of Africa was turned into a great art gallery, glowing under the sun. And it's not without significance that the moment man himself appears on the canvas as warrior, the art begins to decline and the animals vanish. The first fruits of this participation were elementary and practical, connected with man's own struggle for survival. For instance, he learnt from the animals how to find water in times of drought. Although the great river beds looked dry, the scent of the animal told both of them that there was water beneath, safely stored away from the sun. The most meaningful aspect of the impact of the natural on the mind of man reveals itself first in the appearance of the story inspired by a sense of wonder. What, for instance, was it that gave the giraffe its unique shape? And what was it that the nature of the giraffe evoked in the spirit of early man? The bushmen who told me their story of the first spirit, Mungu and the hippopotamus, had this to say about the giraffe or old higher than the trees, as they call him. Mungu designed him in this way, they said, and gave him a heart of curiosity so that he could keep a watch on everything in life. And when in the beginning the sun didn't know his way about the heavens, Mungu had the greatest of all giraffe tossed up onto the ledge of the night to keep watch on the footsteps of the sun. There he stands on guard for them still, in the constellation we call the Southern Cross and the Great Dipper. Through the giraffe, curiosity was converted into a heavenly principle. The spirit of inquiry was put at the service of reason and intelligence, of which the sun has always been the master image in the imagination of man. Through the bird, Man was made aware of one of the great perils that threatened his communities in the beginning, the peril of numbers. He would notice that whenever birds congregate most, like these common weaver birds, their standards decline. They build their nests so badly that within days of completion, a gust of wind brings many of them down. Man also didn't fail to notice how quarrelsome these birds became and the way they tended to swarm in vast numbers to raid and devastate the fruit and the plant life around them. The really inspired architect and fastidious spirit in this world of birds was the individual who worked on his own, like the red-headed weaver bird. His nests are so well built that they withstand the storms of rain and wind for as long as ten years. He produces this result with his wife supervising the construction from nearby 
often rejecting two or three of his structures before moving in. And such is the respect that male and female evolve for each other in the process that he gives her the whole nest for herself and their children, and then builds another for himself nearby, nature's first version of a twin-bedded, rather than double-bedded existence. Indeed, from the life of the bird, so diversified in species and talents, man came to some of the most important of his conclusions. As he watched them as builders, listened to them as masters of song, and saw them released in flight, they inflamed his creative sense of wonder. In time, the bird on the wing came to represent all that was truly inspired and spontaneously creative in his own spirit. Like Plato, man came to think of his own imagination as a cage of birds. That is why the African chief tended to wear the feather of a bird and the band around his head as a sign to his people that he was full of truly inspired thought. The greater the inspiration, the bigger the bird chosen. The greater bustard, the heaviest of all birds capable of flight. The ground hornbill, enemy of the destructive elements in earth and wood, the hornbill's cousin and ally, the hoople, the shimmering starling specialist in vigilance and industry, the secretary bird, heraldic killer of poisonous snakes. Each species had their own special message to man's evolving self, intimations of the future, and messengers of the coming of the rain. As man joined all living things in making for the nearest shelter against the impending storm, a feeling of awe possessed his senses and protected him from exceeding the measure of his human proportion in the scale of things. So close was this identification of man with nature that even the rain became a person to him, a person of the early race. And he visualized the rain in the form of a great bull, a bull whose breath was the mist of morning, and a bull who came out of the sky to make love to the earth. And the earth was a person and a woman of the early race. And this archetypal woman of the earth, this archetypal bull that was the rain between them, they produced the plant, the vegetation, and provided the food for all living things. And indeed, so deep that this sense of participation, this mystical participation between man and the rain goes, then when it didn't rain, when there was a very severe drought, his women would cease to be fer fer fertile. They couldn't have babies. They, like the earth, had to wait on the coming of the rain before they could have children.
And as the rain bull vanished, his voice full of the triumph of his conquest, the voice they call thunder, and his eyes flashing with the passion they call lightning. It was as if the earth had conceived instantly and brought forth. And overnight, the thorn, this thorn which had seemed so dead and so white, had suddenly started to bud. The flowers came out and the animals danced for joy. The springbuck bounded higher in the air than ever, and the whole of life was full of a sense of new increase. Through his encounter with rain and storm, man had achieved at last a new degree of humility. A mere insect could preside over the creation of the mythology of the Bushman, the first man of Africa. Kangana. Kaite, kaite, kum, kaite, kum, kangana, kangana, kaite, kum. I have been saying to this insect here what the first man of Africa said to him in the beginning. Because we are in the presence here of something which is for me one of the most moving demonstrations of the importance of man's relationship with nature. The elephant, the lion, the buffalo, even the crocodile in the religions of Africa play an immense role. But here in southern Africa, where man's association with nature was the longest and the least disturbed, man's imagination was inflamed by this insect sitting here now listening to me in an attitude of prayer which gave him the name of the praying mantis. And the Bushman picked on him because he learned from nature that there was nothing so important in nature as the small. That it was only by giving the utmost reverence to what was apparently small and defenseless that one achieved spiritually what was great and significant. And this insect inspired the greatest legends and myths which are in our possession in Africa today. <laughs> We have been talking here with one of the last survivors of the first people of Africa, the race who depended so much on nature and their natural environment, and whom perhaps of all the people in the world, the natural and the animal made the most impact. The stories are endless. Their rock paintings, as we have seen, illustrate the dancing, leaping animal life of Africa, as no other art of rock painting in the world has done. And we have been talking, he and I, about one of the greatest of all their stories, a story which is a great point of departure in all the cultures of the world, and that is how they came to find fire. Now, it's not surprising that fire, which was the greatest gift of life to man, should be identified with the greatest of all birds. This Promethean bird was, of course, the ostrich, the god hero of the Bushmen, the Mungu, whom we call Mantis, saw one day how the ostrich took fire from beneath its wing and used it for cooking. He recognized instantly how precious a gift it was and tricked the ostrich to stand on tiptoe, wings outstretched. He dashed in, snatched the fire, and ran away to give it to men. But the ostrich to this day is so dumb, so shaken with shock, that it lost 
the sacred charge of fire that is singularly absent-minded. And he tells me that wherever you see ostrich eggs in the desert, you'll notice that all the eggs are arranged in a circle except one, which is outside. And that one is kept outside because the ostrich is so feeble-minded. Unless it had that egg outside to watch, it would forget what it's doing and get up and walk away. That goodbye of the bushman, uttered with all the electric consonants of their language, is always made more moving for me by the fact that they never look back. If you did, they say, you would see the other again and never go at all. And as all mythologies stress, the forward-moving spirit looks back at its peril. And the few survivors of this ancient race left in the deserts of southern Africa observe this first commandment still. Their story about the theft of fire means so much. Fire always and everywhere is a symbol of consciousness in man. All living things were given names by Mantis immediately after the theft of fire. It was the Bushman's equivalent of the coming of the word. Your name shall be Tortoise, said Mantis, and you shall be utterly Tortoise to the end of your days. All living things were then dressed in their individual colours, each colour spread on by a different honey, indicating how sweet, how loving an act this was on the part of Mantis. It was a sign for all to see. Each creation, however great or small, had its special place and meaning in life. and the trees played almost as great a role as the animal did in inspiring the man of Africa and his imagination into new areas of awareness of himself. And perhaps no other tree illustrates it better than the baobab tree. Now the story goes that when the first people of Africa came into the world, they found the first great spirit Kung Kung, very busy distributing plants and trees to the animals and telling the animals, this is your tree, go out and plant it. The only animal that was left out was the hyena. Now the hyena plays a very particular role in African imagination. It represents the dark satanic side, the evil force. And the hyena is said to have come to Kung Kung and said, now look, Kung Kung. Are you surprised that I behave so badly? You've given all the animals trees to plant, except me. And the story goes that Kung Kung took compassion on the hyena, gave it the baobab tree, and the hyena, out of spite, went and planted it upside down, and that's why it looks like what it looks today. When I first met the original people of Africa, they had an expression, the time of the hyena. And when I asked them what it meant, they said it meant a moment in the life of the human being when the forces of darkness were facing him. It meant a time when the human spirit was invaded by a feeling of utter blackness. They used it for the end of life they used it to describe states of madness. And I said to them, but why the hyena? And they said, don't you know, in the beginning of the people of the early race, the hyena had a tremendous battle with the morning star. The morning star, which represented 
for them the element of life which hangs between night and day and which has a glimpse of what complete illumination of light can do and a glimpse also of the power of the night. And this morning star in the beginning was married to the most star-like animal in the whole of Africa, the lynx. Now the hyena was extremely jealous of this illuminated relationship and tried to break it up. The morning star became aware of the hyena's intrigue. One dawn returning from his hunting in the plains of heaven, an arrow in his bow and a spear in his hand, he found the hyena installed in his own home and tormenting his wife, the lynx. The morning star was furious and threw his spear. The hyena, dashing away, ran through fire and burnt his hind leg. And that is why he has a limping walk to this day. And for them it was evident that although it is impossible to destroy completely the forces of evil, yet with the help of this kind of awareness which the morning star represents, you can mark evil in such a way that it's recognizable to all human beings and they have for the first time a choice between good and evil that they themselves in a sense can be a morning star arbitrating between night and day. From this point on in African awareness, Mantis, already armed with the fire of consciousness, begins a series of fateful battles. The first is against the elephant. Why the elephant? Because to the first people of Africa, the elephant represented the titanic aspect of nature, a natural force that was as excessive as it was dangerous. An elephant will uproot a whole tree to get at a single leaf. Like the gods of ancient Greece, Mantis had to fight the Titan in this world to bring it back into lawful proportion. Bushman's stories are full of incidents of how the elephant destroyed the small and vulnerable in life to which Mantis was so singularly dedicated. But somehow, he always managed to defeat the elephant, and at the end of a long mythological campaign, he emerged victorious, for he, like Tom Thumb, had what the giants lacked, the weapon of greater consciousness. Then came Antis's war against the baboons. And why the baboons? The clue is the name the Bushmen gave them. They always refer to the baboons as people who sit on their heels, thus raising them above the animal level. For they recognized in the baboons the power of reason and intelligence, but also a tendency to put the critical analytical faculty to an excessive and unlawful use. Mantis found over and over again that whenever he had a new vision of life, prepared as he was to submit it to a rational appraisal, the overcritical baboons tended to tear it apart. Hence the war, which is an archaic image of what we call a difference of opinion. Once more Mantis wins, because in his war against the elephants, he had acquired the gift of proportion. And so at last, the mythological evolution Mantis represents comes to its fulfillment in perhaps the most meaningful evocation of all, in the lion. And why the lion? Because for the first man, too, it was the most royal of all his symbols. Among all the animals of Africa, the lion combined for him diversity with proportion. He is powerful, courageous, highly intelligent, tenacious, and swift. He sees as well by day as by night. His scent is as keen as that of the elephant but he does not abuse this formidable combination of talents. He never kills except for food, and his tolerance of all other forms of life are recognized even by those he is forced to hunt.
Although devoted to his family, the lion is at heart the cat that walks alone, the symbol of the individual. Observing this, Mantis steps back. It's over to you, he says to man. No more battle, but a reckoning between you and what the lion represents. I've given you fire, a sense of proportion, and the power of lawful reason. Now you must learn from the lion to also live individually not only collectively. With all these stages accomplished, it is as if Mantis a representative of the infinite within the small sends all living creatures with reassurance into the night. Uh, Amos, uh, Manuel, have you noticed since we've lit this fire how quiet it's become? It's all very still now. Now, you know, there's a story about this. You know the great first spirit, whom the Bushmen call Mm, and whom the Zulus and the Shangans call Amkulumkulu. Now, it is said in the beginning, Amkulumkulu, he looked down, and he saw there was no fire on earth, and he felt very sorry for the people. So through the ostrich, he sent them fire, and the fire was taken from underneath the wing of the ostrich. And he gave all the people on the earth, he gave them fire. But the trouble was that when he gave them fire, all the people who had been at one with the stars, with the trees and with the animals, they were all one. But when the fire came, all the animals ran away from the people. And the people were left alone and people felt terribly alone, and even the trees felt alone. And they say before the fire came, there was no wind. After the fire came, the wind began to blow, and even the trees started to shake with fear, because they knew, like the animals, man would use the fire to sacrifice them to the fire as well. Do you know the story? No, Peter. Ask, ask them, do they know the story? Okay. Very, <laughs> Well, whenever the Zulus told me this story about Amkudunkulu, and when they came to the end, they always say, out of the dark, there came a great big elephant with a long trunk, and he blew the story and the fire out. There is a story about the breaking of day, told by the Hottentots, an ancient African race most akin to the Bushmen. Their first great spirit, Haitsi Abib, was killed again and again in the battle for life, but was always resurrected. They saw him, for instance, come back in the reddest of dawns, bleeding from his victorious fight with the power of darkness so that all living things could have light on earth. The evidence of his victory was there. In the peace that fell over bush and river was the coming of the day.
this peace and harmony, this long ancient relationship between man, the animal and nature, so full of meaning, was suddenly and brutally interrupted by the appearance of European man. Ironically, with the help of other animals like the horse and the dog, it happened first in southern Africa some 300 years ago. By the middle of the 19th century, a new human phenomenon, man who killed for the fun of killing, penetrated into the heart of southern Africa. His own drawings and paintings show the impact of the beauty, the wonder and the abundance. Yet despite all this, he was incapable of restraining the strange lust to kill. As the first shots rang out, dismay and a new fear went deep into the animal heart of Africa. this was evidence of the most alarming kind. It showed how far European man had lost contact, not only with nature in the world without, but with his own natural self, a portent of a lopsided development in his spirit, which was to lead inevitably to the kind of mass self-destruction of the war in which I myself had taken part. It was clear that man had almost totally lost the sense of reverence and wonder for all things great and small, which Mantis and his friends had kept alive in the spirit of the first people of Africa. Fortunately, there appeared among European invaders men who saw the horror and danger of what was taking place. Whole species had either vanished or were in danger of extinction. It means a great deal to me that the battle to conserve what was left of this abundance started in my native South Africa. It began first with an attempt to preserve the white rhino, which had once lived all over Africa. In my own childhood, less than ten were in existence, hiding among the hills of Zululand. The battle was fought so well that the white rhino is the great success story of animal conservation. And it set an example which led to the creation of vast reservations where black, colored, English and Africana people are inspired by a common love of the animal and nature to work together in a relationship which could be a model for the future. There is a great meaning for me too in the fact that it was the rhinoceros who reawakened man's lost respect for the animal, coming as he does from the age of dinosaur and pterodactyl. Through his enigmatic behavior, he became the most rejected among the rejected animal life of our time. Our lack of understanding of him was as great as his fear of us. Even now one knows that any advances towards him can still be misunderstood. Happily, the Earth of Africa itself sets an example of how this pattern of rejection, symbolized by the rhinoceros, can be redeemed. The great Kalahari Desert presents us with its own significant version of man's relationship to nature. This abundance of natural life of which we have spoken and of which we have seen so much evidence in the beginning of Africa was not confined to the privileged areas. It was not confined to the well-watered 
the well-grassed areas of Africa. But most movingly of all, this abundance was committed also to this great wasteland of the southern Kalahari, which lies behind me here. This wasteland is unique. Although there is no surface water, it has one of the most widely distributed forms of natural life to be found in the whole earth. One of the most unique and original kinds of being, both of man, beast, and insect. Here to this day, this rejected earth, in a sense, is parable earth. It's like the, par like the remark in the New States Testament, where it was said that the stone which the Masons rejected became the cornerstone of the building to come. This became a kind of temple for the first man of Africa. When he was driven out of his fortress, out of his natural home in the more privileged area of Africa, he came here and joined the unique animals and the vegetation of this Kalahari desert, and here he lives to this day. And as he stood here perhaps 20,000 years ago and looked round about him, he saw the purple and black Hemsbach, he saw enormous herds of Irland, he saw the dancing springbok, and when it rained, this despised, this rejected earth, grew flowers, grew vegetation, and grew the sweetest fruit that you could possibly find in Africa. And this, to this day, makes this area for me by far the most beautiful. This area is Cinderella Earth, and in the mind of first man, this paradox that what is despised and rejected can be transformed in the most beautiful manifestation of life of all. This was demonstrated to him here. This lesson he took to heart. And this, as it were, is the sermon on the dunes he set the course of his life by. The desert, the rhinoceros. They both seem to me to carry the same message. They call him the white rhinoceros. It's thought to be a corruption of the word wide, applied to the wide lip, which distinguishes him from the rest of his species. But as I encountered him again, safe and no longer rejected, and more prepared than I had ever experienced to let me come close to him, I knew that there was more to it. I felt I was standing in the presence of a mythological animal, one that evoked the symbol of the unicorn, a symbol of transformation in which two become one. The unicorn was white, and in him one horn performed the service for which all other animals needed two. In this aspect, he was a living embodiment of the union of opposites, and a summons to human imagination to transform its own divided self. With fear banished between us, I felt as though a gap had been closed, not only between him and me, but within myself. And so, having taught man how best to live in the here and now, the animal in nature had one last great service to perform for him, a service that we need as much today as in the beginning. I've always been deeply impressed how the animal, towards the end of his life, will separate himself from family and herd, not because he's forced to, as many believe, but as if out of some inner necessity, like the Hindu, who in the last quarter of his life feels compelled to take to the road alone in search of salvation. It is as if Mantis was command to man to live also as an individual, as taught him that faced with death, the final reckoning too must be his own. And observing all this, natural man had a natural answer. He had a story about it. And this story puts it very simply and very poetically. It says that in the beginning, when all things were people of the earlier race, the moon looked down and saw that animals and human beings were afraid of dying. 
And the moon said to the hare, which was the fastest animal it could find, said, run, go and tell the people on earth that as I in dying am renewed again, so they in dying will be renewed again. And the hare being in too great a hurry got the message wrong and told the people on earth that unlike the moon who in dying is renewed again, they in dying would not be renewed again. And the moon was so angry with the hare for getting such a vital message wrong that it struck it on the lip to mark it forever with a split to show that it had bore false testimony to a matter of fundamental truth. And this story is also told by the Japanese about the dying Buddha, who, seeing the animals weeping around him, said, Animals do not weep. As the moon in dying is renewed again, so I, Buddha, in dying, will be renewed again. At the end of the African day, the first man brought back from nature an answer as full as it was clear. There is living meaning, not only in the brief here and now, but also in death and beyond. Outwardly poor and himself rejected by our technological world, he walked rich in his own experience, certain of his significance in the scheme of things. And with a sense of belonging so close that he even spoke of the vultures who presided over his end as our sisters the vultures. Unaided, out of his long alliance with nature, man had made of his spirit a fortress of light, wherein he lived unafraid of the forces of darkness which the hyena represented, certain that no matter how fiercely they attacked him, the hyena would always retire defeated again, and leave intact his vision of creation as a process not just of birth, procreation, and death, but of life infinitely renewed and renewing. By taking back into our love and keeping the rejected white rhino, we have found, I believe, a new road towards wholeness, the transformation which Unicorn has symbolized throughout the desperate years behind us.